And we are live. Welcome to the HP Lovecraft Literary Podcast at hppodcraft.com. Live video roundtable uh, when we are discussing post-Lovecraft weird fiction. Uh, I am Chris Lackey, co-host of the HP Lovecraft Literary Podcast, and joined with me is, as always, Chad Pfeiffer. Hi, I'm, I'm glad to be joined with you. <laughs> and we are with uh, four panel members, and I will just have them introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Julie Dinkins. Um, I was supposed to say some other things. Oh, I'm from Katati, California, and I think the only thing, the credential I could list is that I work in special collections in a library, so many old tomes. Mm, Make of that yeah, that's good. Will. That's good. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Justin Woodman. I live in uh, London, UK. Um, by profession, I'm a um, I'm an anthropologist, which is I guess quite a, a Lovecraftian um, profession. Um, <laughs> and perhaps more interestingly, I actually spend quite a lot of time looking at the influence of H.P. Lovecraft on a whole range of contemporary sort of occult and paranormal belief systems. So um, it's my job is very Lovecraftian in effect. Yeah, yeah. I like that. <laughs> Nick. Nick. Oh. Yep, hello. Uh, I am uh, Nick Suffolk. I live in Hampshire in the UK and I work in museums, so that's a kind of a Lovecraftian uh, background too, maybe. Some, some interesting objects and old cult symbols, maybe. Um, and I am currently working on an escape room at the moment uh, for the, uh, the museum charity that I work for. So uh, that's also kind of uh, exploring some mysteries for us. Uh, I did my first escape room uh, two weeks ago and it was awesome. Is it good? Yeah. I, I love it. Unlock. It's so much fun um, to to make and make all the kind of uh, the little puzzles and and see people being led through it. I'm uh, I'm really enjoying the experience. Ours is called the uh, Curious Escape. Come mm. on, cool. And Paul. Paul. I am Paul Freeland. Uh, this, this is my second. Uh, Second of these round tables is on the, the Lovecraft and film a couple of years ago. Um, I'm a journalist, so I guess you could call that love and a Lovecraft adjacent uh, profession. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and uh, that's about it. And uh, right now I'm in the uh, in the hinterlands of Nebraska. Yeah, a journalist is one of the character classes yeah. in the Call of Cthulhu roleplay. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. Wow, this is a really cool panel of, uh, of folks who've got together. I'm excited to talk about this stuff. Chris, you have a few questions? I do. Yeah, yeah. Looking at the body of work just prior to and then after Lovecraft, it seems that there is a lot more weird fiction as a genre now uh, due mostly to the fact that Lovecraft did it and his circles. Um, how do you think, and I'm going to just pass this to one of you, how do you think Modern weird fiction is still influenced by him in a more general sense. And we're going to ask uh, Paul. Oh, shucks. This was, this, was, this was the one question I was going to punt on. <laughs> <laughs> you can certainly you punt did. on it now if you'd like. You're punting. It's, uh, so, Nick. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I kind of think um, one of the ways that he's influenced um, modern weird fiction is in uh, the, the very kind of idea of the unknowable. I think the unknowable is incredibly important in, in almost all Lovecraft stories. Um, and that gives a lot of flexibility to modern authors who are reinterpreting his work, both through the mythos. So the mythos, you've got a, a, a pantheon to work with, but you don't really know what the pantheon wants, what its aims are, what its... Mm -hmm. Uh, occupations, i.e. cults kind of supporting them, uh, and people can use that within their own um, fictional setup, so they can change what they're about, they can leave it unknown, um, or they can create their own um, slightly Lovecraftian um, pantheons, uh, a little bit like Clive Barker's Hellraiser, um, I, I feel there were quite a Lovecraftian pantheon that was created uh, in the background. Uh, Justin, do you have any um, thoughts on how modern queer fiction is influenced by Lovecraft? Yeah, sure. I think, um, to me, it comes down to Lovecraft's cosmicism, um, largely, that 
what 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 Lovecraft was kind of writing about was um, really kind of linking into I think some sort of broader I guess kind of cultural changes that were taking place um, you know in European and American society at that time and I think the Lovecraft mythos very much reflects a kind of modern world view of our place in the cosmos and I think that continues to resonate today so I think letting that that sort of shift away from the more traditional supernatural to um, Lovecraft's more kind of, I guess, secular uh, view of horrors is, is something that's been taken up by a lot of contemporary authors. Yeah. Julie? Well, um, what those guys said, <laughs> but also, <laughs> also is thinking about, it's kind of hard to express, but there's a sort of, um, a kind of almost grossness every once in a while in uh, Lovecraft stories that it, it's not really violent, but... Um, you know, kind of icky, that uh, authors like um, like Willem Pugmire often sort of delve into, and uh, Jeffrey Thomas too, another one of my favorites. So, um, where they kind of not a bit revel, I guess revel a bit in this sort of these sort of gross moments, but it's not really explicit, and it's not really you know, you know violent. That's that's what I was thinking of. I could possibly dig up an example, but I'm not sure. Oh, I know. In Pugmire's story, there's a great story he does in the Tangled Muse. If you know his book, the, that big old book, Tangled Muse. No, no. This beautiful thing. God, I love mm. this thing. Anyway, in Some Buried Memory, where the protagonist is this woman, and she's preening in the mirror. But what she's talking about is how she is the most hideous person in the city or the world or something you know she's she's so proud of her hideousness and he talks about like her bristly horns or whatever I can't remember exactly but yeah stuff like that it's pretty awesome do you do you think uh, I'll, I'll throw this to uh, to Paul this time now why was Lovecraft so influential on all these modern authors like what, what about him stands out among all of the other ones uh, other people that wrote weird fiction, I you know, Black, uh, Blackwood or Mackin or any of these other guys, they just they don't have crazy fan bases like Lovecraft has. Why is his work so? Stephen King doesn't talk about Mackin, you know, Clive Barker doesn't talk. I mean, maybe he does, but Lovecraft is the one that re resonates. What about Lovecraft made him special? Well, I, th I think, and and this might just be my particular view of it, but I think uh, Lovecraft's writing it strikes a chord that you isn't often struck uh, in uh, you know in the in this sort of, in this sort of fiction. And I think, uh, oh gosh, I'm sorry, I'm, uh, uh, Justin, I think mentioned specifically talking about uh, our view of our place in the cosmos and you know how that view has evolved and especially right around the time of when Lovecraft was hitting his stride when uh, when when Hubble first discovered that you know the, the Milky Way was not all that it was but it, I think if we call that I think the scientific term for that is a Copernican displacement that they like you know from going from geocentrism to heliocentrism and I, and that it, it, it was uh, you know, another step backward from our imagined importance in the cosmos and I think you you don't, especially in time like in the twenties, you know, it's a really optimistic era, you know, the Roaring Twenties and all that. You, you, they, you, that, that sort of pessimistic, uh, I don't want to say humble, but you know, it's, it's self-effacing view of uh, humanity and our existence. You didn't get that a lot. Uh, at least that, that's that, that's the way it seems to me anyway. Just if I could just jump in real quick, that I think that the reason that Lovecraft is so influential on, on you know writers after his time is because of his his writing style is so unique, for good or bad, and it's something that you can imitate. I mean, the writers like uh, Robert Block or Ramsey Campbell, who had longer careers, started out by doing very you know to a to a fault. Lovecraft impersonations in their stories. And then they keep writing and slowly develop their own voice, and then hopefully what's left in their later work is the spirit of what Lovecraft is writing about, his sense of cosmicism. 
that's left over and the imitation is gone. But so many writers in you know start out by doing that. And Stephen King, you you mentioned that he. By the way, Stephen King does talk about Arthur Mack, and he loves. I know Mack. he does. I after I said that, I remembered that he <laughs> yeah. did say that. So. But uh, um, but you know he had his Lovecraftian uh, pieces as well. You just can't help yourself. You know, at some point you want to imitate this guy. His Jerusalem plot <laughs> is just a imitation of Lovecraft. Uh, but didn't mean to uh, to to jump in there, Nick. Uh, what was your what, what do you think about this? Yeah, I, I think another another point is his is kind of amorality is is unconcern for good and evil, um, which is quite a change from from a lot of the horror writing, a lot of the myths that have gone before, um, and I think that's had a huge influence on on writing through through time. But also the brightest settings that he wrote in. Uh, variety of settings, variety of, of uh, time periods that he wrote in as well. Um, so it gave you a huge breadth to work with. Uh, Justin? Mm. Uh, I think there are a couple of things actually. I think uh, he just did really great monsters. Um, <laughs> and I think there's a massive appeal there. I think. Um, I think I'm, I'm sort of borrowing that from uh, China Mieville, I think, that, that the, the monsters he created are so unique and so memorable. Um, but I think I'd, I'd also agree with what, what, what's been said before. But I think that in relation to that, particularly where Lovecraft's work and the mythos continues to resonate, is that it does, in some senses, reflect people's experience of, of everyday life, that we, we kind of um, we live in the face of immense and impersonal forces, but today we kind of, you know, it's kind of like state bureaucracy or uh, transnational corporations in the face of which kind of people feel powerless and lacking sort of agency. And I think um, approaching that experience through the sort of symbol or metaphor of Lovecraft's monsters is still really salient to today for, as a means of people kind of getting to grips with that experience. You know, it's, it's funny, Lovecraft's monsters are so impressed upon mm. the people's minds in pop culture, even if they've never read any of his stories, yeah. they have a basic understanding that they were creatures with tentacles and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I always find it funny, and I've heard it said where somebody was wearing like a t-shirt with an octopus on it, and somebody says, oh, that's very Lovecraftian. Mm -hmm. That's an existing <laughs> animal. <laughs> Not Lovecraftian. The octopus was around way before this guy was writing it. <laughs> Millions of years. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Uh, you know, one of the things that also... I think that might have helped Lovecraft endure is just his voluminous correspondence. The mm, fact that he yeah. not only wrote to so many people, but he encouraged other authors. Yeah, yeah. And his encouragement and his willingness to share uh, That's, yeah, exactly. sort of spread mm, yeah. his ideas and his writing up yeah. around other writers. Mm. And then some, some other writers that had picked up his work. Like, I think Robert Block is outstanding. He's a great writer. And he would have been a great writer probably without Lovecraft, but maybe not. And mm -hmm. Robert Block was a big uh, evangelist of Lovecraft's work, and it could be, you know, that, you know, just having all of these people that loved mm -hmm. him and his work, and then that get out, you know, they're like, oh, you like my stuff? Oh, well, you should Lovecraft. He's the guy that inspired me. And then that just goes back. I yeah. I think that is definitely a contributing factor, but probably not. Mm -hmm. Julie, yeah. did you have some additional thoughts on this question? I think of him as um, open source. <laughs> Lovecraft mm -hmm. is open yeah. source. Yeah. The way he shares his mythos, I, mm -hmm. I totally think that's one reason why he's lasted. Mm -hmm. I also think, and this has sort of been touched on, he really appeals to outsiders and loners. Mm -hmm. And also atypical heroes. You know, He had all these stories that had um, heroes that most of us could never be, and his heroes are like, you know, guys who work in um, special collections in the library, you know, historians. And, yeah. Well, archaeologists. And anthropologists. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Which, by the way, anthropology is what I graduated in. But. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh-oh. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Places filled with them. Uh -uh. So, um, Justin, what are some of your favorites of post-Lovecraft weird authors, and uh, mm. what's the appeal? Why, why do you like them? Mm. Um... I think the first one that really comes to mind is Thomas Ligotti. Um, I, I think what the, when you when you first encounter Lovecraft and you encounter that kind of cosmic vision, you sort of think, well, where where can horror go next? And when I read Thomas Ligotti, he kind of for me took it to the next level. Um, 
taking some of the themes of alienation and the sort of psychological displacement you find in Lovecraft, but just kind of pushing it to a completely different place. So um, I think Ligotti would probably be at the top of my list. Um, I have huge, huge fondness for Ramsey Campbell as well as kind of, I guess, one of the early post Lovecraftians, but I mean I mean he's still writing in that tradition now. I think what 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 Ramsey Campbell does is to incorporate a kind of social realism with Lovecraft's sort of fiction, um, and that kind of makes it more relevant to to the world that I, I guess I kind of live in and experience as well. Um, and also Laird Barron, I mean I love his work as well, just really um, really kind of Different spin on Lovecraft, but definitely you can sort of see the threads of Lovecraftian uh, ideas running through his work. Yeah, I think those three stand out. Paul? Well, I think the first one that jumps to mind is uh, I, I've, re I've really developed a liking for Yuji Foster. Um, yeah, I think yeah, it's a, yeah. some of. Uh, yeah. I think. Um, and I, I and admittedly, I I think I listen to as many podcasts as I do, you know, as much as I read. And mm -hmm. hearing a lot of her work on like sort of um, Dravelcast and whatnot. Specific, yeah. I think what what I think really I, what I enjoy about that is like there's a lot of she melds you know, the, the ideas of the weird fiction, but also Eastern mysticism. Um, you know, that, that definitely a uh, you know a, a woman's uh, perspective on the world that again. You you, uh, you don't always get in weird fiction. It can be very deeply at times. Mm -hmm. um, and and also uh, and also Sylvia Moreno Garcia, who uh, I think equal equal parts uh, author and editor. But a lot a lot of the anthologies she's edited, like mm -hmm. historical Lovecraft, uh, She Walks mm -hmm. in Shadows, and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. Mm -hmm. right. You know, th those are really enjoyed yeah. reading those too. Especially She Walks yeah. in Shadows because. You don't get a lot of female female characters mm -hmm. in Lovecraft work, but you know some of the stories in there they explore Virginia Watley, Asenath Way, Chuck Diggeroff, and all that. Uh, Julie. Um, well, I, I guess I already mentioned I'm I'm a big uh, Pugmire fan and uh, Jeffrey Thomas. Although Jeffrey Thomas, I haven't read any of his books that are set in that. I can't remember the world that he writes in. Any Punk Town. I haven't Punk read Town, any of those, yeah. but. I haven't read any of those yet, but I've read some other things, and I'll, my favorite book right now is Encounters with Enoch Coffin, which is written by both of them, and so mm. Pugmire writes a chapter, or a story, and then Thomas writes a story, and mm. they just, they're about the same character, Enoch Coffin, and they kind of, but they really work well together. Their styles mm. are different, but they work, they work really well, so I... I do love both those authors, I and also Ligotti, and I can't believe I haven't read Laird yet, although I, mm. I want to. But, um, yeah, Jeffrey Thomas can do some, he does some pretty interesting things in, uh, mm. in his stories where, and they both do this thing where they find beauty in, in horror. Mm. You know, mm. and, and in Enoch Coffin, and that, there's just all these, you know, Enoch Coffin is an artist, and there's a there's a point at which this guy is being wrenched down into a it's like a well, and like his body slams against it. It's like the side of the well, and Enoch sees this happening, but he's in a bit of a distance away. But he's watching it kind of with horror, but also he realizes the worst thing is that he wants to paint it, you know, and he can't, you know. But it, it was so <laughs> amazing. He wanted to paint this scene. So it's those kinds of things. That kind of beauty and horror that they both are really expert at catching, capturing, in my opinion. So, Nick. Um, well, kind of. Uh, I think authors like uh, Neil Gaiman um, particularly yeah, appeal to me, that. and some of the stuff that he's done, both around Lovecraft, but also other weird fiction. I think he's um, an amazing person for spotting the opportunities for new worlds and helping you into them and making mm -hmm. you actually uh, care and understand about them. Um, I think also Shiny Mirville, obviously Perdido, Street Station, mm. um, books like that, really kind of mixing Lovecraftian ideas, maybe mm. some Burroughs in there as well, um, so doing quite a lot of interesting mm. things, and, and really taking um, the science fiction side of, mm. of Lovecraft, which is in there, uh, a little bit further yeah. on. Um, and then looking uh, maybe a little bit more at the, the mythos uh, side of it, um, Charles Cross, I, I enjoy uh, mm. his writing. The Laundry with, Series. The Laundry mm. Series, yeah, which yeah. is... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. With that mythos. Mm. 
uh, but in quite a light-hearted and amusing way uh, and, and genre-bending. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so, the, well, since you asked, Chris, uh, <laughs> 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 no, I actually don't. You guys are great. I don't have much to contribute. The only author that I thought of that wasn't much was Brian Lumley. Um, mm -hmm. I have not read in decades, but mm -hmm. I loved his uh, Necroscope series when I was in mm -hmm. high school. I just gobbled it up. Uh, it was a cool mashup of vampires and um, and the Lovecraft mythos, and I, mm -hmm. I it probably holds up. I haven't read it many years, but I, I think it's it's got good gore, and it's just a really you know fun read, pulpy read. Has anyone read um, Daryl Gregory? I found out about him today, but I've not read any. I don't think so. No. Uh, no, say the name again. Uh, Daryl Gregory. Daryl Gregory. No. No, he's writing in the genre of parents, but. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, one of my favorite uh, writers in the the weird is uh, Chad Pfeiffer. I don't know if you guys have read it. <laughs> <laughs> I have one of his books. Yeah, weekly, I do. Yeah. It's really yeah. good stuff. <laughs> Rock solid. I wish he would do more, but he's just too busy jabbering and not writing. So. That's right. Right. Blah, blah, blah. Let me record it. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so this is a, a, a question. How uh, how does weird fiction differ from horror? Uh, and I'm going to throw this to Julie. She gets it first. Uh, what is the difference? Like, or, or to you, what, what do you feel like the difference when somebody says this is a weird tale and this is a horror tale? And are they mutually exclusive? Um, I don't... I don't know that they're mutually exclusive. I haven't really thought about this much at all. I think I just blend them so much together that I think most thing, most horror that I like would be classified as somewhat weird. So what is that? So that means I should know what the heck that is. But I think it's um, there's got to be unknowing. There has to be mystery and um, and an unknowingness or an unknowableness or whatever you know crafting term you want to put in there. Not nothing. I like it when things are not apparent, when things are are confused, and maybe I don't know something like that. Yeah. Uh, sorry. No, I think that that that's actually you know what it is. Yeah, I agree. I. I, but I'm going to make other people answer the same question and make it, and say it in a different way. And say different things. No. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so Justin. Right. I mean, um, yeah, I, I, I'm not entirely sure that you can separate the two because to me what constitutes the weird is that it involves a kind of intrusion of something that's kind of outside of our everyday experience into the everyday world. And I think by its very nature and our human response to that, that, that often is a, a kind of experience of horror. Um, but by the same token, I think what, what we sometimes miss about Lovecraft is that not only is his work a work of, his body of work a work of horror, but it's also about awe and wonder. And I think, yeah. I think that you can have that kind of notion of the weird um, that is about exploring that experience of strangeness um, and how it impacts upon people's lives in a way that doesn't necessarily evoke horror. Um, I guess a, a writer who kind of springs to mind who mm. I don't think people generally associate with Lovecraft in fiction, but who's sometimes been kind of attached to the new weird is uh, M. John Harrison, um, a British writer who's kind of written some sort of space opera recently, but also um, what what's kind of classified as weird fiction, where I think he very much addresses or, or, or takes that approach that it's about people's how 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 the encounter with some completely outside experience transforms people's lives. It's not necessarily yeah. always about horror, right. but yeah, I think I think that experience often is one that people respond to with horror. So it's a, a continuum, maybe. Nick, anything further? Yeah, I, I kind of think uh, I'll take I'll take what he was saying about about the other there, and I think um, that's perhaps a key element uh, in in weird fiction. It being about an unknowable other. Uh, and that's one of the things Lovecraft said that he found most terrifying is is the other that that which is um, mm -hmm. strange. And I think that's reflected in both his writing, but also his worldviews. If if you 
pick up some yeah. of the kind yeah, of little so elements of, yeah. of racism that are in there. Yeah, it's really absolutely. people being different and people being mm. other and therefore being frightening. Um, so I think that's a that's a, a kind of key point in there. Um, but also, yeah, just just that there are greater motives that are there. So mm. people aren't just or monsters aren't just evil. They are mm. up to right. something and have a motive. Mm. You just don't know what it is. And I think mm. if you either discover what the motive is, or they just don't have one, they're evil. It's not really weird fiction. It's horror. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Paul. Mm. I have maybe you know maybe a, my, I took it a, a little too literally because. I, my, my thinking, like, the, like the Venn diagram of horror and weird, there's a lot of horror that, but, you know, <laughs> not necessarily one and the same. I, like, yeah. for me, horror doesn't necessarily require uh, supernatural or fantastical mm -hmm. elements. Right, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, th 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 this will betray me as, a, as a, a movie buff. I think, like, the first thing that comes to my mind, horror, but not necessarily weird, anything like Silence of the Lambs or... Oh, yeah. Or... Mm -hmm. or, yeah. or, or, or yeah. Yeah. Enter Hitchcock movie here, and I, I think that that would be the biggest thing. Now, now weird, weird can certainly be horrific, but, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. I mean, it can just be weird and out there and strange without necessarily mm -hmm. bringing in mm -hmm. dread or or the fear of the great unknowable. Mm -hmm. Do you? This is changing topics a little bit here. Do you think that the mythos are are weird, or any story that involves the mythos are weird, or can the mythos themselves be just used as monsters, or are they just by their nature inherently weird? And I'm going to throw that right back to uh, to Paul. Um, hmm. But I, that, that's a tough one. I think it doesn't necessarily have to be. I think I, I have I, the, when I read the question, I have one specific example that I left to mind. Uh, I was thinking of uh, Two Whatever by Shane and Garrity. I think it was, uh, it was the People's Choice winner uh, two years ago. You know, it, it's you know, it's it's got it's got that mythos flavor, but it's essentially a comedy. You know, mm -hmm. It's uh, you know, slap you know, uh, slapstick affair. You know, it, typical. Uh, Invisible, unknowable creature moves into an apartment and hijinks ensue. <laughs> so I mean, again, that's you know, it's one data point, but I think it, it I guess it just the, the, the you know mythos or mythos adjacent stories I guess don't necessarily have to be weird. That you you can you can take that base mm -hmm. and then build off of it, what you know whatever yeah. you like. Mm -hmm. Nick. Um. Yeah. I think. Um that it depends how literally you take the, the mythos elements uh, that you're talking about. So I think if you if particularly graphically now, you, you get uh, Cthulhu used all over the place on mm. t-shirts, on cuddly Cthulhu's, on uh, games and toys, and that's taking mythos elements, but it's certainly not weird fiction in any way. There's no, there's no horror in it. It's almost taking uh, him as a, a stand-in for Godzilla. So um, right. you can kind of take elements from it, not take it very seriously, and it won't be. Uh, Justin? Yeah, I, I, I would agree um, entirely with what Nick just said, actually. I mean, I think um, and it goes back to Chad's point about you know, seeing an octopus on a T-shirt and saying, oh, that's Lovecraft. Yeah, I think... Um, the way that the, the, the Lovecraft's kind of monsters have been sort of popularized and commercialized often kind of extracts that element of the weird. Because when you obviously when you read something like Call of Cthulhu, Cthulhu isn't a giant humanoid with an octopus head. These are kind of an, an analogies that Lovecraft is kind of using to um, try and give a sense of its you know, utter, utter kind of weirdness. But I think, yeah, I think it's it's really open to um, all kinds of kind of genre mashups. And, Going back to someone like Brian Lumley, who I, I'm a big fan of, but I mean, he, he, his work is very pulpy, and the the, the, the Cthulhu mythos are kind of like um, the antagonists which the heroes are kind of battling against. And you don't really have a very strong sense of the cosmic in, in Lumley's work, but it, I think it really it works really well um, as a just different kind of spin on, on, on the mythos that's kind of more pulpy and action-oriented. So I think it's a very wide church, as it were, in that respect. There are, there are so many elements present in Lovecraft's work that mm. you can 
extract to whatever purpose you'd like. So there are the underlying yeah. themes of the other and um, you know man's sort of insignificance, which mm. push any story toward the weird, but it doesn't even have to be mm. you know a horror story necessarily to mm. embrace those elements. Then you have the straight up monsters, which work great for pulp, and they work great for yeah. comic yeah. books, yeah. and they work great yeah. for those things. And then you even you know his writing style and just the thing, the tropes that he was obsessed with make for great comedy. I mean that, that mm. the, you know there's a yeah. the great Onion article that says Lovecraft yeah. school yeah. board member wants madness <laughs> added to curriculum. Right, <laughs> great art. You know, there are these things that you can uh, sort of take advantage mm. to, to plug yeah. into any genre. So I think it's it's a fairly yeah. elastic art form. Mm. 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 Joy. Yeah. Mm. Um, well, I think. Everybody's pretty much said what I was thinking. I, one thing I'll add is that I was, uh, was it Paul who was talking about sort of separating the um, horror from the sort of weirdness? Because I was thinking about there's a short film that I saw at one of the conventions. It's about the art guy's an artist. He's drawing someone, and it it's really really hot. He goes out on his bicycle. He stops somewhere, and there's a guy who's carving a tombstone. And it's the guy that he was drawing, and it turns out this guy, you know, has been carving tombstones for eternity. Now they do it automatically. He just does it as a hobby now. But when he goes in and they kind of get to know each other, this guy's actually carving his name on the tombstone. So it's all these really surreal pieces start, you know, happening. And but it's all done in a very kind of non-horror-ish manner. It's it's kind of warm and friendly almost. I mean, you get the feeling something bad's going to happen, but. But they're they're very. Uh, it's interesting that it's sort of separating the the horror from the weirdness. And I guess I'm thinking weirdness often is somewhat surreal. So sure, just absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know something that that, uh, that that Nick said made me think about how if you look at the news through the right filter, the news is kind of Lovecraftian. Yeah. You know, all the time. Yeah, yeah. This current yeah, anxiety yeah. we have, as you said, about the other, this, this mm -hmm. strange society mm -hmm. that might mm -hmm. come attack us, and that's that kind of fear. But then you've also got, you know, curiosity is off on Mars, discovering sand dunes. Mm -hmm. The Large Hadron yeah. Collider is looking into the nature mm -hmm. of uh, the universe, and of course, there's a fear and anxiety about that, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what that could, po you know, what the effects of that could possibly be. Um, you remember when they had blogs for Spirit and Opportunity? Spirit and Opportunity had their own blogs and oh, right, had yeah. like a daily. Gave it a real surreal kind of feeling. I, I thought. Yeah, it was absolutely. Yeah. 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 It was fun. So, though. kind of our last question uh, for, for the discussion is what would you like to see in the future in the genre of weird fiction? What, what do you, where do you think that this genre might go, or what new thing could be uh, brought in it? Or just what would you like to see more? The same old, it's up to you. Uh, I'll ask Justin first because I'm looking at him okay. right now. Well, I think um, one of the things that's already been kind of touched upon here is maybe not so much the content, but who's engaging with the writing of weird fiction. I think it's it's great to see you know, increasing um, diversity and um, a kind of inclusion in the genre, which you know historically has kind of been largely dominated by by white men. So um, I think that's 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 really yeah, it's really encouraging that we're we're getting um, anthologies like *She Walks in Shadows* and mm -hmm. um, stuff that's kind of, uh, again, you know, drawing from a much wider realm of, of experience and difference. Um, <laughs> in terms of, it's, I, it's a really difficult question to answer in some respects. It, it, to me, it kind of goes back to my encounter with Ligotti, thinking I, I just don't know where you can take weird fiction after Lovecraft and Lugotti does for me something that pushes it to a completely different space so I'd, I'd like to see someone come along and try and push it to the next level but what that is I have no idea. <laughs> so, <laughs> One yeah. thing that I you know, always sort of hope for is we talk a lot about how the horror genre really existed in the gothic world around the time Lovecraft was writing. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. We have the big castles and the large romances and those spider webs, and then he brought it into this more modern day mm -hmm. setting. Yeah, yeah. And in that regard, the things that people who are heirs to Lovecraft are doing are often in those very Lovecraftian settings of universities mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. exploration. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, I would love to see um, more. I'm sure it's been done, but I, I would like to see more weird fiction kind of uh, coalesce with the. Hemingway's heirs, you know, the sort of mm. between the lines writers like <clears throat> Raymond Carver or Dennis Johnson, who 
are obsessed with that mundane minutia of life that in mm -hmm. itself is, is actually mm -hmm. distressing in a, in a kind of cosmic level. Mm -hmm. Is life meaningless? Let's get down to washing the dishes. Let's talk about these small things in life, the almost non-plot. Uh, yeah. And, and mm -hmm. I think that that's something that could easily be combined with, uh, with weird fiction. Mm -hmm. It's pretty mm -hmm. interesting. Everyday horrors. Mm -hmm. And the writer that we have advertised on the show a couple times, J.R. Hamantashen, is doing that sort of work right now, so I, I think it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he's somebody who's taking just internet culture, the fact that people are spending so much mm -hmm. of their time interfacing with these machines and then putting mm -hmm. horror spins on it, and it's very modern, and, I, and I'd like to see more of that type of writing. Yeah. Paul? Well, I think Justin touched on one of my big things. Is like, you know, like the the stereotype of uh, weird fiction, the Lovecraftian fiction, particularly, particularly, it's uh, it's a realm of pale white dudes for pale white dudes. But you know, it, it's I, I like to see where it's evolving with the times, and now you know, continue that sort of expansion and bringing in you know, the greater mm -hmm. diversity of mm -hmm. and experiences. And mm. you look at some of the biggest names, even just within like the realm of of the Lovecraftian uh, sphere now. You know, who's mm. you know S. T. Joshi, Caitlin Kiernan, Pugmire, mm. yeah, a couple yeah, times yeah, today. Yeah. You know, bringing in all of these diff the different views of the world and different definitions of weird can only mm. you know, make weird mm. fiction more richer for richer, it. Richer, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then, just, yeah. and then, my my other favorite thing is, as I mentioned before. You know, I'm I'm big into podcasts, and so they they mm -hmm. and, uh, they're in the performance aspect, and well, they're bringing yeah, bringing that yeah. to life. It also aids the spread. But you mm -hmm. know, shows like you know our our two handsome and illustrious hosts here, mm -hmm. Travel Cash, <laughs> and all these skate party yeah. shows. I think it's mm -hmm. yeah, that that's just an, yet another uh, avenue for people to mm -hmm. to get yeah. into. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Nick. Um, yeah, I think uh, there's some interesting stuff uh, going on with interactive fiction at the moment, so I'd mm. like to see um, that become a little bit more uh, Lovecraftian. I know there's some stuff on Twine, and if you've looked on there, there's a, there's a couple of uh, Lovecraftian stories. I think science fiction uh, is somewhere it can be a lot more Lovecraftian than it is. There are some, some interesting pieces out there, but that should be. Um, as regards to mythos, uh, I, I think there should be a bit more to do with Nyatalep. Oh, yeah, I do. Because he's the one that interacted actually most uh, mm -hmm. with humanity. Mm -hmm. He's the one that's yeah. most interested in interacting with humanity. He's the one that was left behind. And yet yeah. he's the least, one of the least famous uh, mm -hmm. that there are. There's, there's least done with him. Yeah. Um, so yeah. a little bit more exploring that. Um, and probably more uh, cats going to the moon and uh, exploring mm. the power <laughs> of the Dutch language, probably. I've heard that a lot recently. <laughs> I think this, um, you know, movement like, let's go deeper on the bench for these monsters because we're mm. getting tired of the yeah. Cthulhu's and the Yuxa. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Get into those, uh, I don't know, let's get into Sithogu more. <laughs> well, sure, go. Sure, go. Sure, Julie? Um, well, a lot of great things have been mentioned. Uh, one thing that I sort of like to see, and it may sound a little odd or silly, but is uh, incorporation of animals. Animals know mm -hmm. when stuff's happening. You know, I mean, just think mm -hmm. about sometimes they seem to be, you know, a little more aware than we give them credit for. So I always uh, enjoy creepy, mm -hmm. creepy uh, stories that incorporate not talking animals or anything, but you know, animals behaving normally, but they they're you know they know something's up. Uh, also, different generations. I don't know if there's a lot of weird horror with like children. I mean, mm -hmm. I know I believe Chad wrote a story with children, right? They were, or they were teens, weren't they teens? Sure, they were young. Yeah, they were young folks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but uh, that's always kind of interesting to me. So, it's sort of different generations and other countries. I mean, most of the stuff I read mm -hmm. tends to be set in um, Europe, mm -hmm. the U.S., and I think Africa would be pretty fascinating, mm -hmm. or you yeah. know, stories set in those. Absolutely. And you know, I, you, you said something really. I get excited about that as well. And I've lots of times talked. If there's a Patricia Highsmith uh, collection. Oh, yeah. You know what the name of that books. is? It's the Beastly Book of Animal Murders or, or whatever. But, you know, when you write yeah, yeah. from an uh, animal's perspective, it doesn't have to be mm -hmm. Disney, right? So she's got, right. The, no. she's got these stories where the protagonist is an elephant. And mm -hmm. it, she is obviously she's anthropomorphizing it a little bit, but you, you really feel for this element. You know, it's an elephant that was taken away from its mother and its homeland right. and has been in a, in a circus giving rides or in a zoo giving rides to kids and... 
and has gone through a couple of different trainers, and you just can't wait for this elephant to kill this current trainer. <laughs> but, but, you, but it's a devastating story to read, and there are so yeah. many in that collection, one where there's a main character that's a camel, there's one where it's a horse, and right. you you know they're, they are just as clear, and um, you know they are protagonists that you can get on board with, and you don't want things to happen right. to them, and their perspective is so yeah. unique. That I, you know, mm -hmm. I completely agree with you. We don't always have to have uh, human characters yeah. driving our stories. Yeah, I mean, I just feel like too with weird fiction, and this is something that it might even be out there that I don't see enough of. Is it are people that are just have more mundane lives, like mm -hmm. a, weird, a protagonist that's a plumber, or a protagonist mm -hmm. yeah, that yeah, works yeah. in, mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. an office mm -hmm. uh, with other people. Mm -hmm. You know, where there's just uh, mm -hmm. where it feels more ordinary, and so when that unnatural element comes mm -hmm. in, it, it really is unsettling, and uh, I, I'm sure other people are writing out there about those types of things and having that, but that, I feel like that bends a little bit more because Lovecraft was so mm -hmm. kind of steeped in the world of academia, yeah. and, and yeah, yeah. he really loved that. I mean, he, he himself wasn't really that much of an academic, but the, the you know, his characters and his protagonists in universities yeah. and all that stuff was important to him, and I feel like that opening it up might... Uh, mm. There's that great, uh, um, that great Ray Bradbury story, the name of which escapes me now, but the main character is a house, essentially. It's like oh, a yeah. smart home that oh. does all the cleaning. The, do you know the name of it? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but the silhouettes. Right. Well, yeah. if some yeah. apocalyptic event has happened and the people are all gone, but the, the house right. goes on. Mm. It's really, mm. yeah. uh, so sad. So sad, right? And, <laughs> and, and, and that's very hate those. Uh, nihilism about it that is present in mm. Lovecraftian work, and, and the main character in yeah. that story is a house. You know, it's very, yeah. very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, that is going to uh, wrap it up for us. Uh, we we we're out of time now. I want to thank all of our guests for being uh, so awesome. Julie, Justin, Nick, and Paul, thank you so much for not only contributing to this conversation mm. but contributing to our Kickstarter and helping us. Uh, oh, you uh, bet. Yeah, do nice. all the things that we've done. Uh, <laughs> any any uh, final words uh, before you we, we sign off, uh, Julie? Oh no, thank you. I love the HP Lovecraft Literary Podcast, mm -hmm. and uh, it's just been you know definitely worth anything. Everything I've ever contributed could never <laughs> pay for the, the amount of joy that you have given me. Oh, <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Come on. Uh, <laughs> Likewise, yeah. Thanks, guys, for for all the work you do and put into the podcast because it's it's mm -hmm. yeah really great stuff. And um, certainly, I feel privileged to be able to yeah contribute in this very small way to keep things going. So yeah, great work. Thank you so much. Wait, but do you have anything to contribute? I, not that I don't love this praise. <laughs> <laughs> do anything to contribute on the on the subject? Any last thoughts? Um. Well, I, I, I guess this is just a general thought. It's really fantastic that we are living at a time that seems to be um, a kind of golden age of Lovecraft in fiction. There's so, so much of it. Not all good, but there's, there's so much of it out there. <laughs> um, much of it very good, and it's just fantastic to see you know, Lovecraft stars, star rise at this moment in time to be part of that. Right. Nick, any last thoughts? Um, well, uh, kind of echoing everyone else a little bit to, to thank you because also you got me into Lovecraft. I actually came into Lovecraft oh, from right the podcast, on. not the other mm, way around. So great. Great. What? You favour there. <laughs> I don't know how I found you. It doesn't really make any sense, but apparently I did. Um, so I, I'm kind of grateful for that. Uh, and just to say, it, it's a potentially a great time for, for Lovecraftian mm. fiction at the moment because you've got literary fiction, you've got cinematic mm. fiction, mm. you've got live mm. action stuff, you've got role play mm. games, computer games. Mm. Uh, interactive fiction, and it, it is all really suited to exploring mm. the other. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. I have oh, no thoughts. thoughts. <laughs> 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 Excellent. Well, thank you guys okay. so much. We had a really thank good you. time talking about thank it. Uh, I jotted down a few names here of people that I, uh, authors I haven't heard of, and I will definitely be checking mm. out. So, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I'm Chris, uh, I'm Chris Lackey. <laughs> I'm Chad Pfeiffer. Thanks everybody for tuning in to this roundtable discussion. Bye bye. Good night. Good night. Bye -bye.